I'm here today with some of the Crichton's management team, including Bernard Johnson, Group Managing Director, Pippa Clark, Global Sales and Marketing Director and Deputy MD, Eamon Murphy, Group Finance and Commercial Director, Barry Cook, Acting Managing Director of Emma Hardy, to learn more about the Emma Hardy acquisition and what they feel this brings to Crichton's. Congratulations on the acquisition. Pippa, can you tell us a little bit about Emma Hardy? Yes, of course. Thank you, Tamsin. Emma Hardy is a range of luxury premium skincare products that was originally started by a facialist called Emma Hardy. So it's steeped in development and knowledge of the skin and the best botanical ingredients for skincare. A range of products has been developed over the years that focus on high-end premium cleansing and moisturization. And some of those products have become quite cult in their status in the industry with regard to both industry insiders, but also consumers, offering solutions for all types of skin types and skin ages. And why has Crichton's acquired them? Emma Hardy is a premium position skincare brand that we as a team have aspired to for some time. And the opportunity came along to buy the brand because it adds to our portfolio of brands in terms of ensuring that we enter that premium space within the skincare category. We have a range of brands that cover lots of categories within the mass space and we really have a desire to move into that premium space particularly within skincare because it's a category that's in great growth and it's one that consumers are really wanting to purchase in terms of performance products it really complements what we're doing in terms of retail strategy we have great coverage with our brands in the mass space And Emma Hardy has really great listings, both in bricks and mortar and online, with retailers that we don't currently have much exposure with. So that would include players like Marks & Spencers, Space NK, Look Fantastic, uh, Feel Unique, Cult Beauty Online. It also has very recently entered the Amazon premium space in the United States, which is very interesting in terms of development, where Amazon have opened up a trading platform for very premium brands where they're protecting those brands and giving them a platform and access to the Amazon consumer, but in a way that is going to protect the premium price position of those brands and who is offering those brands online. So there's a bit of exclusivity to that in that the brand can only offer the brand products. So that's a really interesting development, which also is something that will complement what we're doing in Crichton's with the rest of our brands and bringing something new to us. The other thing that this is really doing is pushing us into that, not only that premium retail space, but is bringing a consumer to our brands that we currently don't have within the portfolio of our brands. So that's giving us a really great opportunity to connect with a different type of consumer that may also have the benefits of cross-fertilizing into some of our other brands, which I think will be a great benefit for us. The other thing that it will it will bring to to us is the opportunity to develop the brand into a, international markets, also within premium retail in international markets. We already have nice coverage again within the mass market within our brands, but this will allow us to bring the brands into in, into our international markets within more premium retail spaces and within online internationally. It also further gives us an opportunity to develop into other categories within skincare in the premium space. So we're very excited that we could take this brand perhaps into the spa space. We believe we could take it into the men's space. We think there is an opportunity to do some nice crossover potentially within fragrances, maybe also within self-tan where the skinification of self-tan is happening and bring elements of that category into the brand and really extend, if you like, the product bandwidth and the product spread of the brand as well as premium gifting the brand already does some really nice work in that space but we think we can with the skills that we have within our business we can extend the brand quite significantly into premium gifting as well so there's lots of benefits that the, the brand is bringing in terms of premiumization in terms of retail space in terms of the retailers that we'll be dealing with 
in terms of the consumers that we can bring to the, the Crichton's brand portfolio and in terms of the markets that we can enter and the different types of retailers that we can enter with this brand. And in terms of the revenue growth that you'll think you'll get from the brand, I think the current revenue is about 3.8 million. Do you expect that to stay static for the first year or are you expecting it to, to grow a lot even from year one? We are ambitious and we believe that we can definitely deliver some growth within year one. The current team of Emma Hardy have done some really great groundwork, not just in terms of the product portfolio that they're offering, but in terms of the social media and the advertising that they've been doing, but also in terms of the sales opportunities that they've been generating. And I think one of the things that the brand had reached kind of its peak was the opportunity to turn those opportunities into reality. Barry Cook, the managing director of Emma Hardy Limited, is staying with us and the business for the foreseeable future because we think there is a fabulous opportunity there for us with our resources to help support him really close down some of these sales opportunities that have started to generate with the Emma Hardy brand. So, yes, we feel that within year one, I would like to think that we could add probably up to about 20% onto the brand within year one by giving the resources that we have in Potter and Moore to the support, to the team of Emma Hardy that have already bought this brand on really well already. And beyond that, by the time you get to your 2024 ambitions, what revenue do you think it'll be doing then? I would hope to think that we would have doubled the brand by then. I think it's definitely got that opportunity. Um, I think the thing that's very exciting is that the consumer awareness on this brand outstrips its current sales performance. We have a consumer out there in multiple markets and in the UK that really there's a very high awareness of the brand and the sales have not quite matched that awareness. So there definitely is a gap there to fill that is really exciting. And I think we already have plans for new retailers, new markets, new products to reach that kind of expectation on driving those sales forward. And what can we expect it to do on margins? There is a great margin opportunity by bringing this into the Crichton's family. Number one, manufacturing and bringing manufacturing in-house is going to bring us a kick on margin, you know, very, very quickly in terms of when we're able to turn bring that in-house. I think there is also an opportunity in terms of what we do in buying. Um, we've got a very strong team in terms of what we do in terms of purchasing that I think will also bring some margin enhancement there. So very positive in terms of what we can do. I think we've demonstrated a track record to date where we've bought previous brands and companies where margin is a big focus for us. And from day one, that will definitely be what we're driving at in terms of driving to those, that higher return. And um, what do you think the blended margin will be once it's bedded in? I think that will depend, Tamsin, on what we achieve in terms of customer mix. Um, so different customers will, will demand different margins and different mix on product. So I think it will depend on what we do there. But the goal for us will to be ensure that we're driving that higher return. So, Barry, as Acting Managing Director of Emma Hardy, it's obviously a big change to you. How do you feel about the Crichton's acquisition? Uh, good afternoon, Tamsin. Um, I just want to say thank you to Pippa for what was an amazing presentation on the brand and the knowledge that she's gained so quickly um, of Emma Hardy. And from us as, if you like, founders of the brand back in 2011, it was always our goal um, to find a partner that we could take it to the level we felt the brand was capable of getting. And... You know, we've thought about it in a long, and we saw the synergy between Crichton's Potter and Moore and Emma Hardy, both British brands, both based in the UK, um, as a fantastic step and opportunity to take Emma Hardy to the level that we thought it could go to. Um, because, you know, we're a, a natural skincare brand and we're fighting huge competitors in this market and you do need to have a partner that is capable to to grow it to the next stage and as owners um three years ago we felt that we're taking it to the level that you know we would get it to in the next three to five years um and to find a partner to work with like potter and more with 
manufacturing capability, R&D capability, uh, resources in packing technology that is so important today. Um, and our products are not easy to manufacture. So we were limited to who we could partner with because we use so many um, natural raw materials within every product, sometimes as many as 10 to 15 different raw materials. And to actually be able to produce that is not an easy feat. So we feel as though we found um, the perfect partner to be able to take it forward. And how did you know of Crichton's? Uh, we've both been attending the same exhibitions throughout the last 15 years. You know, we've we've followed Potter and Moore and Crichton's for many years, actually in the background, just admiring some of the, the products they've done and the amount of brands that they've purchased. And obviously, we knew them as manufacturers. Um, but, you know, because the, the products are so difficult to make, um, you know, we continued what we're doing and we, we had our goal to grow the brand as a skincare brand. So it's a premium skincare um, that is, as Pippa said in her opening um, speech about the product, it's a botanical range. It's not, it's not easy. And um, it's targeted to uh, specific ingredients to um, suit the problems of skincare. And the consumer is very educated today in what they're using in skincare. You know, with the digital age, um, it's made everybody aware of what every product contains. So what does Crichton's offer to you? Manufacturing capability, um, which is, is huge. Uh, research and development into new products, um, new uh, ingredients, uh, putting formulations together that other factories just don't do. Um, and, and it's about making sure that the product that we produce delivers to the consumer what we want it to deliver. So that's one of the biggest um, resources that we think we can, we can use. And there's a huge team behind uh, Potter and Moore and Crichton's that, you know, to international, internationalize the brand, we are a British brand, but we are in international markets. Um, but the resources you need to be able to develop that brand further uh, you need the support of somebody like Potter and Moore behind you to be able to achieve our own ambitions. You know, our ambitions was always to build a global brand. Our ambitions was, you know, from day one when I went went into this with Emma, it was to build an international global British brand in skincare. And that's what we think we will be able to, or sorry, know we will be able to achieve with the resources of Potter and Moore. Eamon, in the last results presentation, you guided towards acquisitions at five times EBITDA, and you're paying 6.36 million for 47,000 pre tax profit with Emma Hardy. So it seems a more expensive acquisition. Can you say how you've justified the valuation? Yes, good afternoon, Tamsin. Uh, um, certainly. So the, so the EBITDA uh, on the last accounts from Emma Hardy was in the region of 0.2 million uh, at an EBITDA level. And we did at the last presentation indeed guide a, a five times multiple of EBITDA in terms of the type of acquisition that we were looking at. So so on the face of it, you know, we, we would need to be seeing a, an EBITDA in excess of 1 million uh, plus in respect of this uh, acquisition. So Certainly, as part of our process, when we looked at looked at the business, loved what we saw. Uh, we saw lots of opportunities to add to that e EBITDA number of of point two that I alluded to in, in June twenty. So, I mean, I would say that the EBITDA growth will come in a number of areas. First and foremost, uh, in top line growth, uh, as Pippa and Barry have explained, we see this brand as having tremendous opportunities uh, to grow domestically and internationally in a digital format and bricks and mortar format. So first and foremost, we'd like to see the growth in the top line and we do see tremendous opportunities there. So obviously top line growth will deliver uh, profitability um, uh, to complement the top line growth. Uh, secondly, then there is the manufacturing savings that we believe we, we can bring, bring to bear. Uh, so obviously by taking this product in-house, uh, we will add our 
add add the product to our existing manufacturing operations, uh, we will get manufacturing savings by virtue of that trans- transfer when it happens. Um, and then finally, there will be other synergy savings, which will be overhead, uh, cost reduction savings that we will make uh, as part of the transition um, in this brand. So, you know, by virtue of being a, a bigger business, we'll have savings for sure in, in overhead for procurement. Um, we will also have a probably a simpler distribution uh, operation than is currently the, the, the place uh, within the business. So when we put all those together, you know, can we see ourselves getting from 0.2 EBITDA to in excess of 1 million uh, EBITDA when we put all of that package and opportunity together? So abs- absolutely we can. So uh, I, I think that's how we would justify our, 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 the uh, acquisition in the context of those five times multiples that we spoke about. What do you see as synergies? What what um, figure do you see as synergies, both on overhead and on manufacturing? How much? What sort of quantum are we talking about there? Well, I, I think we'd be in the region of you know the the range of if I put if I put the manufacturing and and the cost saving synergies. You no, know, we 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 would believe we'd be in the region of probably you know point six to point eight something something along those lines would be would be the synergy and manufacturing savings that we'd we'd we'd, uh, we'd expect to make. And how are you going to finance the acquisition? So the five million cash element of this deal uh, is financed uh, exclusively from our own internal cash resources. We had a very strong trading year last year, so we generated a significant amount of cash. So that cash that we generated last year has basically been utilised uh, for this transaction. Uh, so we don't need any external debt. Um, as things stand at the moment, uh, we have unutilised um, uh, facilities of seven million on our invoice uh, finance and seven hundred and fifty. A thousand, and we have agreed uh, to increase those to up to fifteen million in the form of revolving uh, credit facility with our bankers. So we're just putting through the formal legalities of that at that at the moment. Uh, so that cash will be available. That debt will be available to us uh, to pursue other acquisitions and to grow the business. And do you think the revenues and profits of Emma Hardy were hit last year by COVID? Is that factored into the valuation at all? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, certainly, the development and the acceleration of the growth in the brand was certainly impacted by by COVID last year. Like 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 many brands, obviously the high the high street closed down, uh, but but certainly they they were partially offset by the growth, the significant growth in the digital. Uh, sales of the business. Uh, so looking forward, we, we'd be optimistic that we will be able to pick up the growth, pick up the development and the brand in the way that Pippa and Barry have outlined earlier. Bernard, congratulations on the acquisition. Thank you, Thompson. Does the acquisition pose any operational challenges? I can't think of challenges. I can only think of opportunities at this stage, Thompson. I, I'm like a cat with two tails, an Olympian with a gold medal. This is a brand we've stalked for five or six years. We admired so much. We've admired what Barry and his team have done. And thankfully, they're prepared to join us and work with us uh, for as long as it takes and for at least a year. Uh, and we're delighted about that. So any any limited challenges there are, I think Barry and his team will help us overcome those. And how long do you think it'll take to fully integrate it? I think full integration will probably take six months. In the first three months, we we leave things very much as they are, uh, and 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 study the situation. Uh, but within within six months, with our team of development chemists, with our team of uh, standard chemists and quality control and manufacturing, which we've we've we're continuously increasing in strength and ability, I don't think we'll have a problem. I can't wait for the challenge, actually. And will there be any operational benefits? Yes, of course there will be. Um, it will give us uh, increased volume in buying. Uh, it will uh, make transportation easier uh, or more rational. Uh, every aspect, even when we go in on the sales side, we go into retailers. It's nice to go into the wider range of of, uh, of premium retailers. This This brings us into a position where it's not, uh, don't ring us, we ring you. That's on the other foot now where, where, where people are pursuing the brand like premium, uh, Amazon premium in the United States, want to have the brand there. 
that's the kind of position this takes us to. And we're delighted about that. Um, do you think you'll move it to or to Peterborough or, or where geographically is it going to be based? We've got we've got options on that. We've got a great uh, we've got a great team in Devon. Uh, we've got a great new operations global operations director with huge amount of experience. We've got a great team in Peterborough. Um, it'll probably be done in both places, just depending on where the, the capacity is and where the expertise is at that. As it, as it is required. Not not a big challenge that it's, it's actually nice to have that option. And um, can you tell us a little bit why after five years of being in pursuit, the acquisitions happen now? Because that's the way things go. You know, we don't rush into anything and obviously they don't rush into anything. Um, I, I think probably COVID and, and lots of pressures in, in in smaller brands we find this that a lot more brands are talking to us a lot of them aren't aren't uh, delivering or are asking too much but this brand it, it is worth it's a great way to spend five million pounds cash that we have to spare um without without requiring any further uh, um borrowings I, I can't think of a better way to do it but um it's just five years it seems to be the right time and and barry seems to be and his team seem to be pleased. We're pleased. The consu- I mean, this is a brand in demand by both the consumer and by the retailers and by, by our competitors. They would like to buy this brand. Luckily, we got in there first. And can you tell us... As usual. <laughs> and can you summarise how this takes you closer to your 2024 aspirations? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I said that in 2024... And I love doing this, giving us a challenge. We, we, we'll be at 100 million and 50, probably most of 50 million of that will be on brands. And that will make sense because it will feed the, man, the extremely much more sophisticated and automated uh, manufacturing facility that we'll have, which then can spin off into contract manufacturing as well. But this feeds in very well. I mean, it's 10 percent. If you, if you look at 5 million, which we expect to turn over after a year of operation, uh, if you look at that, that's 10% of 50 million. So that speaks for itself. But actually, I think we'll grow organically anyway to 30 and we'll probably add 20 million. Uh, so we need a further 15 million of acquisitions at least. And uh, uh, Eamon has organized some finance, as he's, as he referred to, which we will use very wisely and very quickly to close that out, down that other 15 million. In fact, 100 million is just a... The first that we could beat it by any amount, but we'll not we'll not miss it. Let's put it that way. Well, we'll watch this space, Bernard. Thank yeah. you very much <laughs> okay. indeed. Thank you.